good evening all to the isa online uh, pg class today we have got a very eminent speaker with us dr mulidhar joshi immediate past president isa national chairman isa academic committee he is currently hod of department of anesthesia and pain medicine and director pain management center at rinchi hospitals hyderabad and is what a keen interest in pain education and interventional pain management with more than 25 years experience and number of publications in numerous in national and international journals and he has authored six books also its outstanding achievements include that he developed the first android application in the world on interventional pain management first to start fellowship in pain management in india first to author a textbook of pain management in india and first to start e learning in pain management in india he very rightly was conferred isa academic excellence award in 2010 and he has worked in numerous positions in isa and other national and international associations including president of isa 2019 to 21 gc member of wfsa from 2016 to 2020 member of wfsa safe anesthesia and quality of practice committee 2020 to 2024 member wfsa pain relief committee 2016 to 2020 board of member of asian and australian regional section of wfsa 2014 to 2018 sub editor of pain section on anesthesia tutorial of the week of wfsa From 2015 onwards, honorary secretary of ISSP, honorary treasurer of ISA, uh, 2012 to 14, and reviewer of various national and international journals. Welcome, sir. Uh, it is an honor to introduce you, and uh, I really feel uh, very proud also in uh, introducing you for today's talk on cancer pain management, and I am very sure. Uh, it will be very beneficial for the students including me i request you to please uh, share your thoughts on cancer pain management dr murlidhar joshi uh, thanks a lot navin for uh, those kind words uh, respect to president adgiri i think mean, he also has joined uh, adgiri thanks a lot for uh, joining and uh, well it is a very common topic of course i just uh, like to elaborate but uh, thanks for those kind words navin i think i think you said too many things i don't know how much i am really worthy of that one but it doesn't matter we will move on with life and uh, that's okay i Did think you are recording this particular session i think uh, navin uh, just yes, to, uh, to make sure that should be students should get benefit out of it yes, so, uh, before i, uh, I uh, you start your lecture uh, i'll uh, have two more announcements to make uh, initially all are muted and uh, only the uh, speaker teacher is uh, unmuted you can type your questions uh, into the chat box and we will take up that subsequently if the teacher ask any question to you you please reply in the chat box uh, by typing it uh, this uh, lecture is uh, live on isa youtube channel isa mhq and is also recorded and it will be available on isa website uh, www.isaweb.in in isa academics tab and also on isa youtube channel isa nhq and i formally request uh, dr venkat giri president isa national uh, to briefly say few words dr venkat giri please and then we can move on to the lecture uh, navin before dr giri speaks i think it's not getting recorded navin just make sure that it's 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 it's, 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 it's on the youtube that you are comfortable okay fine, fine. it's done sir. it's done. comfortable fine no problem it's going on yeah dr giri please uh, namaste dear uh, Uh, Dr. Joshi and uh, Navin. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Giri sir, and for your daughter getting into post-graduation seat at the PD Hindu Jain Pediatric. Congrats for you, sir. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, President. Uh, okay, is it clear? Okay. Anyway, thank you. It is a happy time that uh, Dr. Joshi is uh, giving talk on pain management. Uh, And uh, Dr. Joshi is uh, now uh, faculty in the dentistry school and uh, traveled wide and large. 
and uh, they take many many classes uh, all over India. I think nobody helped in that climate change. He has made that. And that shows what he is and how much concerned on the management. And uh, it is for the students to take benefit of uh, your experience and expertise and uh, taking that. But that is uh, involving them in sociality and every aspect you know this uh, pain management and uh, so that we expand our horizons. Uh, uh, from anesthesia to pain management, uh, parent care and clinical care, and uh, this is also one of the now. There are courses on pain management, parent care, so people will take it and it's all to you, and definitely people will get immensely benefited there by your thoughts. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Giri, for those uh, kind words, and of course, we've been working together for more than a decade. We say common things, but uh, Thanks a lot once again, and let's move on to the, the scientific session because already five minutes are over. So that uh, the cancer pain uh, is a question. It's not. I'm not just talking because I know it's not just the uh, post question which are there. Are a lot of consultants also are attending this meeting, and of course, the long run it will be shared with um, many people. I know it very well because it's it's, it's very it's very important for you to uh, have an idea about that one. So the question here is, what happens sometimes, you know, you know like you, know, you might see, uh, especially that I have two groups here. One is the practicing clinicians who already know about uh, the cancer pain, who are already doing it and all those things, or whichever way they're getting exposed. I have got other group who are post students appearing for exams also. And uh, let me make it very clear to you, pain as a subject will be there in every paper, what theory paper, what you're going to attend. It might be cancer pain, it might be chronic brain pain, it might be a PHN like a post herpetic neuralgia, or it could be trigeminal neuralgia, or how to start up uh, pain clinic services and all. Uh, just, just trying to adjust. Keep, keep the door open. That's good, that's good. That's good. Just some kind of adjust. Yeah, leave it. So it's important that it might be in different form or it could be an opioid, it could be cancer pain. So, so many things like, you know, they, it is going to be there. Of course, we don't have an exam case on uh, chronic pain. Sometimes we do get what is called a phantom pain, which can come like a, a theory question also, or sometimes there could be a spotter in the exam. But of course, with uh, so many things changing across the globe with respect to the examination pattern, there could be variation. So let, let's, let's be very clear about that one. Apart from that, also you have to have clarity about uh, certain things. Is uh, how do I handle this pain and all those things? That's the most important thing. Question here is: if you just look at the uh, cancer pain first, like and you look, see what 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 is that like cancer? If you just look at epidemiological point of view, if you just look at it, see just look that like like you know, people are being crowded. Like you have cancer, you have cancer, you have cancer, you have cancer. Fine, no problem, but. People are willing to accept, okay, fine, I may not live for longer time, but let me have a comfortable life till, till the time I have to leave this world. In this context, you have to understand, if you just focus this particular slide, just look at the pink dots. Look at the pink dots which appear in skin. Keep on, keep on looking at pink dots, okay, fine, they are moving. Now you focus on the plus mark in the center. I request everybody uh, who is attending, if, it, if you're comfortable, just focus on the plus mark in the center and suddenly you start seeing a green dot moving, all the pink dots are stuck. If you just lose a little bit of focus, again the pink dots will start moving. The green dot will disappear. Now, how does this happen? The question here is, if you're focusing on sudden so many things and all, you might lose the focus. But if you're focusing on, as an anesthesiologist, I'm handling it, uh, maybe a cancer patient, maybe pain is a first, like, you know, perplexing problem for him. How do I help him and all those focus that one? Automatically, the problem becomes much more clear. You know what exactly you have to do. But there are standard principles of pain management with respect to the cancer pain. And we have to adhere to that one because that has, that has a time tested almost more than uh, five to six decades. People have spent time on that particular one. What are these guidelines? How to go about it? What to do and what not to do? So this is actually, if you just look at probably the, the perspective, what you might be seeing as an epidemiological point of view is uh, pain is experienced by at least 75% of the uh, people with uh, 
what I should say is uh, advanced with advanced disease and by 20 to 25% at the time of diagnosis. So 75% of people with advanced disease come back, of course, at the time of diagnosis, hardly 20 to 25% might be present. That, that's one biggest problem is the cancer, because if it's supposed to present as a pain, the problem they would have reported to some clinician somewhere. But here what happens, the patient may not present a clinician because there is no pain, a painless swelling, he'll, he'll start postponing things. So let me make it very clear. He starts postponing things. Okay, just like some small swelling, maybe over my chest. Okay, there might be some, some kind of this thing and all. It's okay at my age of 70 years, so many things might be happening. But no, that is where the whole story starts. Because 28 to 30% only at the time they have the pain, but subsequently when the better pain appears, it would have infiltrated the nearby structures. And nearly 80 to 90 percent of these pains can be relieved by simple pharmacological methods. Of course, now, of late, whatever we are working under, we think about 80 to 90 percent, we are able to reach up to 60 to 70 percent because so many other components we are able to uh, like, uh, like, uh, think about it, and like neuropathic pain. So many things are there. But of course, this is what I say, but at least 60 to 70 percent people can be managed with only pharmacological methods. You don't have to really go for a much bigger thing. And in 52% of patients with advanced cancer and pain, none of their pain is caused by cancer itself. In this sense, what I'm trying to say is, if somebody has a pain in the body, if I had a cancer maybe 10 years back, now I have some back pain, it necessarily not necessarily be a cancer pain. It could be just because of the facet joint issue, or could be disc problem, or maybe I have knee joint pain as part of osteoarthritis, or could be osteoporosis, or neuropathic pain in the legs because I'm a Diabetic from last 20 years. So things like, you know, every pain in a cancer patient doesn't have to be arising from cancer. This is what you have to understand when you're handling this group of people and reassure them. And of course, when you come to the, the kind of cancer pain, what you might be seeing, pain in advanced cancer can be grouped into uh, four categories. See, we have four categories. The cancer-induced, the, the, the tumor itself keeps on infiltrating the nerve, or the muscle or soft tissue, whatever it is there. So it could be soft tissue, visceral bone, cancer induced. And it could be treatment induced because the kind of treatment what we offer, chemotherapy can lead to neuropathic pain and maybe something like uh, mucositis. And uh, if you give radiation, maybe the local area might get discolored and might cause burning of the skin or the neuropathic pain. And sometimes it could debility induce because of cancer. I might be lying down uh, because of uh, lack of appetite. I may not be able to eat enough or even if you're eating enough that is being utilized by the, the cancer cells to multiply themselves so that they become a much bigger tumor than what they are. So in that situation, I might end up with constipation, mother tension, spasm, or sometimes I should not be saying, but bed sores. If I keep on lying down without getting, without even working, without doing anything, moving out of the bed and lying down all the time, then the skin becomes much thinner and then I might end up with a, a bed sore. And of course, last but not least, concurrent disorder. Like I might be having as part of spectrum, maybe osteoarthritis, maybe spondylitis, and all those things. Though. So technically, we are very clear. One thing is, all pains in in patient with cancer doesn't have to be cancer. One group is yes, cancer induced, possible there. Second group could be treatment induced, which can be there. Third could be debility induced because you are bedridden or something like that. And fourth could be concurrent disease, like maybe. Uh, like a diabetes or something like that. So this part, you have to be very clear. And of course, if you have these four points in your mind, you can definitely write your exams and you can write your, uh, your practical, you can answer all questions. And of course, the practicing clinician will never have any doubt about what kind of patient I'm handling. So coming to principles of pain management in cancer, the most important is uh, when you keep on looking at the problem in the counseling session, especially when somebody comes to that kind of thing, the first and foremost thing the attendant will say is, sir, Please understand, we have not told you that he has got cancer. You also don't tell. The question that itself is a fallacy. The problem starts there only. The patient think, keeps on going to 10 doctors think that no doctor is helping me. That happens because he doesn't know that, that he has that kind of problem, which is uh, question here is it can be kept under control and all those things, but it, it may or may not. But having said that also, we have to understand one more aspect here is because you kept on hiding this fact from him, he was a question here is sometimes what happens, see, they want to know what is happening to them because they might have some property issues which they want to clear. Maybe their daughter has to get married. Her son is abroad and he has to inform him. 
or maybe some loans on the house or maybe you want to inform the near and brother sister and all look i may not be for too much longer time so so many things will be going on through his mind so pain doesn't have to be physical if you just look at the definition of pain as such pain is defined as as different words the question here is if you just look at the whole definition of pain given by the iasp you have to understand it can be sensory and emotional experience with or without associated injury so question here is can be pain the sensory and emotional experience with may not be an injury external but the amount of response to what is handling probably uh, the the students who have watched or maybe consultant who watched the munawa mbbs if you just recall one one situation that hospital when neng boy told like look you got a uh, cancer of stomach and the way he uh, fights with the everybody at that time and all those to accept that one look i have not even started my life already saying that i got cancer that means how much time i am going to live see look at it might look emotional in the movie but question is the facts are same the facts are same you are there and whatever is there and all those things you have to tell the truth to the patient you tell the attendants also because otherwise is the, the patient attendants will say like no okay you write some medication again you that will not relieve his pain because he doesn't know why why is that it's happening Now, subsequently what happens the patient said this doctor was also useless so you get a blame for no reason so always so there is actually saying in sanskrit like you know aadi nishtram is better than ante nishtram like you better be blunt before and look boss we have this kind of problem for this one these are the standard guidelines which are available in the world and all and this is what we are trying to do this is what it is so it is always better like that of course there sometimes to modify the pathological process we might use radiotherapy hormone th- like radiotherapy for like especially uh, a single Uh, what your metastasis over the spine and all those things we might do radiation therapy or for that point to show that patient uh, patient's pain gets alleviated uh, hormone therapy especially testicular tumors secreting so many hormones we might do some kind of arthrectomy or something some hormone supplement chemotherapy surgery wherever it is it's possible of course analgesics we have different group for non opioid is the preferred one especially antipyretic like some the paracetamol but it may not be the thing all the time opiates are preferred reason being it provides sedation also good relief also and progress problem is other group what we have is nsaid nsaid's biggest problem we can't give more 10 to 14 days but these group of people we might modify that particular thing to give longer time at a lower dosage so that we can made a, what is called as a, a multimodal management of course adjuvants are very important especially corticosteroids because sometimes the tumor sits on the nerve root And it keep it will keep on putting pressure on that particular one. There is a lot of edema. So steroids definitely reduce the inflammation and the edema. And antidepressants not as a depression, but they are the things for the neuropathic pain. And antiplatelet is like uh, pregabalin. You talk of you talk of maybe gabapentin, like in Karan Zepin. You can use any of those things. Muscle relaxation where the muscle spasm is there. Of course, antispasmodic like especially J. Management said they can. It may be something like baclofen or something like that. We can try with that one. The non-drug method. There is non-medication method. Drug. I don't want to use the term. Drug means uh, these days in international convention looks like drug means like more for a uh, narcotic addiction kind of thing. But non-pharmacological methods like physical uh, heat pads and tens. We can definitely try out in these things. It's not a, a lot of sympathetic behavior with these group of patients make them feel much comfortable. The sympathy and empathy and of course that is the most. Uh, Question: Explain to what is happening to him, and telling them to be with you all through it till whatever days you are going to be there, and we we'll make sure that you live comfortably, and and we help them out in for in starting for certain things. And the biggest question they will ask, common commonest question they ask is, how long am I going to live? Which nobody knows on this earth. We are here, born when he came here. Nobody knew when he was going to come. We couldn't leave this question. This this questions will be asked and all. And you had a diplomatic answer. Like, oh, why do you have got that particular thing? What responsibilities you have in your hand? Please finish and all. And most of the people, this much public awareness, which is happening all over the world, everybody knows what is happening to them and why it has come to them. Yes, that's a big uh, session itself. Like even the psychological method. Like, you know, he might ask, why only me? Why not others? Anybody could have got what mistake I have done? I never troubled anybody. See, it's just a question of like. What is what is cancer? It's basically uncontrolled multiplication of cells. The same sites are different sites and more multiple sites. That's what it is under. That is so nobody. So sometimes it becomes tricky to answer the answer these questions under. But repeat sittings, repeat sittings, and reinforcing like reinforcing. Look, it's not like this. You have to look at this way and all those things. 
most of the people accept them. Rarely, I, I find very, very rarely somebody resisting and like, okay, fine, say, okay, okay, for whatever it is, only yet assist them in follow what the responsibility they have to complete. Of course, there can be psychological treatment, supportive treatment, like a relaxation, like he needs a break or maybe whatever thing, and that, or CBT, like uh, cognitive behavior therapy to make him feel comfortable. And uh, psychodynamic therapy, like, you know, like uh, keep them mobilizing and all. We keep them comfortable if they want to get back to their work, let them do it. Of course, the water interruption nerve pathways, pathways like nerve blocks and nerve lysis, they are almost at the end of the show, but not at the beginning part of things. So as much as possible, it's always the world most non-invasive to invasive. It's not other way around. So you have to make sure that you start a non-invasive thing. You try with the counseling session and the discussion with them, the whatever therapies and water medication. Only when these things exhaust, then you go for the interventions. It's not because one thing is no, whatever you are doing in this end to that end is palliative. Because some cancers have cured, definitely a lot of cancers compared to what was earlier, definitely they have cured, or some cancers can be controlled. And sometimes you might enter a situation like you know, double malignancy. That also can come. So this are the like, thing you have to understand. Of course, when you use the medications for the this group of patients, you can use a different schedule, but of course, most important you have to understand the like, preferred. Choice always is by the mouth, not injections. Injections, you want to, you need support and don't know it. It's not possible. Preferred choice is by the mouth, by the clock. Because morphine oral tablet can work for four hours. Minutes. Every fourth hour, they have to get a tablet. So that's what you have to understand. Of course, we do these days. We do get what is called sustained release morphine, which can work for 12 hours. That you can segregate and, of course, you can always give something for breakthrough pain. By the ladder, always start with the simpler medication and don't always climb to the stronger medications. And of course, each patient is different. His perspective is different. His, his, his difficulties are different. And maybe his challenges are different. And his problems are different. So you have to address that once. Maybe first one or two settings, you might take about 30 to 40 minutes to discuss with the person to understand him and make him realize. Subsequently, it becomes much easier to handle because once he knows that he do take into confidence, then definitely things are going to move on. Yeah, this is a WHO ladder, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, standard thing for you. Again, this is also one of the exam questions for you, WHO ladder. If it's step one, if you just non opioid I told you, non simpler to the complicated one. First step one is non opioid adjuvants, non opioid plus adjuvant. The non opioid might be uh, like maybe something like a, maybe a diclofenac or something like a kitchen relax, something like that, with adjuvants like maybe like you know, pregabalin or gabapentin. Second one could be weak opioid plus non-opioid, plus adjuvants. Weak opioid could be something like tramadol, non-opioid could be something like diclofenac or maybe acyclofenac, both are same, nothing special. Adjuvants like maybe you can add gabapentin or maybe amitriptyline. The third level will be a strong opioid like morphine. Non-opioid could be still even containing NSAIDs and of course adjuvants. Look at this life span as such. Uh, keep a strong look on this particular picture because we are going to walk into one more uh, thing as uh, Blind and all, and I think Polly and Naveen, if he's around, he can help us. Or maybe you can also type in the chat box. So, this is one question. Whenever you get this kind of slide, please enter. What are the you understand that there is a question for everybody? Writing session, anybody can answer. What are the common constraints of constraints for WHO letter at all levels? Most important constraints of medication, like we discussed about opiates, about talk about adjuvants, talk about strong opiates, and all. You have, you have four choices here. What are the question here is that what are the common constraints of WHO ladder at all levels? One could be weak opioid with adjuvants. Second could be non opioid with weak opioids. C, it could be adjuvants with non opioids. And fourth, it could be strong opioid with adjuvants. You can reply in the chat box. The time starts now. You've got around 10 seconds to type. Yeah, uh, Navin, I would like, I'll be happy if you can moderate. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. The majority have answered C. I, I think, uh, yeah, you, you, I think Navin, you give one minute time, so I want to wait till. 
but one minute i just still want to wait for one minute now other we will go to the previous slide again you want me to go back to previous slide hey, let, let them uh, uh, see some are answering a yeah yeah but uh, if you want me to go back to all this now when you have the freedom to tell me yeah sir. we will go to that uh, later again one, once you once you say something then i'll go to previous slide yes, one minute is over sir so majority have answered c and some have answered a okay fair enough. i understand the, the maybe i understand the, the complexity in this particular answering it's not so is because there's a previous slide about this one but uh, I, I, i'll go back this this is what exactly the wlh will add and this will come in exam but even if somebody answer this way that will don't be there about that no see it's we're all in learning learning stage i i always told like not like non invasive to invasive so non opiate plus adjuvants is the wlh will add non non opiate could be like diclofenacer ketrola could be paracetamol also adjuvant because neuropathic pain because you might have started them on maybe some neuropathic pain medication like maybe maybe pregabalin gabapentin or maybe of course this medication if you not heard you will you'll learn about that one but keep this particular picture in mind so if you just look at step 1 it was non opiate adjuvants step 2 non opiate adjuvants step 3 non opiate adjuvants that means all levels we wanted one non opiate adjuvant reason be if we keep on into opiate doses it will cause nausea constipation and sedation and the person may not be able to participate in the day to day life activities that's the reason we are not recommending too much of opiates trying to keep him awake so that he can still continue to work he can still continue to work contribute back to the family and the society and he feel comfortable make him sedated lying in the bed at home it won't help us so that is where the whole thing we have to understand is it it is a holistic approach we have to understand now if you just look at it at all three levels non opiate adjuvant was there non opiate adjuvant non opiate adjuvant even people even if they answer uh, i would like to say uh, this way that you know, don't don't think you know, think about that we are not trying to give judgment here you know it's not like that but question but i'm glad so many people have uh, participated uh, uh, thanks a lot navin for helping i think after every 10 slides they are going to get one question like this let them be focusing on the session right sir thank you lord thanks a lot so the, uh, the answer is uh, c there's uh, like you know uh, adjuvants with non opiates because it will be there at all, all levels at all levels so answer is c of course for inter slide uh, inter slides will be available for you in full lecture so don't worry about that one but don't you think twice that what mistake you no know, don't worry about we are not looking at anything we just want to make sure that you, you have understood the process coming to non opiates uh, i told options and sets biggest difficulty is if you handling chronic benign pain it becomes a problem sometimes it because reason being chronic benign pain when you handle it becomes because you can you're not supposed to write a nsaid prescription for not more than 10 to 14 days for obvious reason of ga toxicity or, or or renal toxicity but sometimes you're forced in this group of people because if you keep on increasing the opiates they end up with constipation nausea listlessness a lot of the some people go into confusion and all those things so sometimes people do use knowing the life span like if the life span is for example 6 months or 1 year and all explain the the facts to the family and you can take it and all but coming to the paracetamol yes paracetamol you have the liberty you can go up to use up to 4 grams per day of course these days we try to limit it to 2 grams per day reason being so some people might be having the unsuspected chronic liver disease i repeat again unsuspected chronic liver disease 2 uh, grams they say but definitely you can you go up to 4 grams no issues at all and of course diclofenac sometimes you might say prescription 50 mg say diclofenac works for about 8 hours or sometimes sometimes you might say, people give diclofenac once a day you can modify but question is something what happen if you give half the dose the relief can be half it won't work like that it has to be proper prescription as per the the what was half life and also don't forget lean body mass many of these people may not be take having adequate input they might be dehydrated malnourished and maybe the water they using the uh, medication or whatever thing it the tumor is using so this is the uh, dosage don't forget about it this are the standard medication which is for chronic pain pain same thing applies to the cancer pain also diclofenac 50 mg 8 hourly ibuprofen 4 to 6 mg 6 hourly ketrolac 10 mg or up to 30 mg in go 68 hours and first time all of course find 1000 mg 4 to 6 hours almost on 4 gram so this you can you can so advantage adjuvant with non opiate have you seen non opiate what are the opiates which you might be using 
code in with the lot of difficulty we had at narcotic bureau we had a big discussion a few years back and all and the code in the right now is only available for the cough syrup not for the, the cancer pain relief and all they think that uh, it's a narcotic the addiction kind of thing though. then dextroprofloxacin which is available for us that that also got uh, banned because they found on the high seas uh, somebody exporting this uh, medication to some other countries doll tramadol it's available definitely over the counter you can use it but of course tapentadol also is almost subsequent derivative of the uh, tramadol but of course tramadol has uh, both the neuropathic pain medication neuropathic relief also and also no safety also combination while tapentadol has as per the the pharmacokinetic dynamic properties it has more of a no safety property but not of much neuropathic pain property if you just look at the opioid usage criteria so there are different kinds of pains what a person might be getting i told you there are one group which is called as opioid non responsive pains even if you use opioids they won't get relief example example is tender point because muscle spasm i told you like when they don't take adequately they will have muscle sprain here some muscle tear here that that may not respond to opioid in that context what they will have to do it there are different so opioid non responsive pains tender point muscle spasm don't use opioids use non opioids like maybe diclofenac or maybe uh, ketrolac or paracetamol fine opioid partially responsive pain that's half of nerve compression pain bone pain metastasis you can use steroids or maybe something like for reducing spasm and all those things you can use some um, muscle relaxants who could not the muscle relaxants as what in anesthesia we have got uh, some thiacolcticoside and chloroxazone all those things are there then you can opioid responsive pains but do not use opioids they respond to opioid but don't use because squash stomach syndrome this is like in some tummy pain under functional ball pain because these things can lead to a spasm of the sphincters where the probably you heard like in the sphincter of audi opening into over there or the pancreatic one and all the things they can just go to spasm so even though they respond please for the especially ga spasm and all those things don't use this thing uh, definitely you can use spasmolytics which are available yes there are there are some opioid responsive pains some fractures and here and there there you, you have the liberty to the opioids and nothing wrong about that one and the gold standard happens to be morphine now for the lot of type one we keep on educating and so many things but if only thing is we recommend that morphine should always be given with a non opioid because that can reduce the recommend morphine you understand why we are trying to reduce the recommend morphine if the starting dose is 5 to 10 mg 4 hourly you can do that sometimes people say especially in kerala is one of the Uh, best model in our country where the have the parity care support and all those things they have been doing a phenomenal work which you can't even imagine a poly poly people in kerala are lucky enough to watch this particular thing it's a has become now a, a more of a state government program the starting dose they morphine five ten with the fourth hour lips the biggest problem one thing is every fourth lip they have to take you have to wake up the patient to give the tablet now you get the same morphine uh, maybe a uh, sustained release which you can use once in 12 hours that's much more acceptable and then you can use the if say for example if i had to give somebody 30 mg morning 30, see if, if for a whatever dose he is taking it divided by maybe uh, six doses if he is taking 10 mg every fourth hourly right 10 mg every fourth hourly six doses 60 and uh, doing 60 mg make it 30 mg twice daily sustained release and you 10 mg as well there could be some what we call the breakthrough pain that's a different entity out to this sometimes everything is stable suddenly patient gets pain for that one you can always have risk analysis about that one so no maximum dose and can be depend see there no maximum dose of morphine that's what you have um, the people who have been taking 1000 mg 2000 mg also and they are comfortable so it it, it all depends severity of the pain is the driving factor there not the pleasure i repeat again pain is the driving factor in this group of patient not the pleasure But of course the always we keep on saying is the hand which writes a prescription of morphine should also prescribe one laxative one antiemetic prophylactically we have to explain to them this medication known to cause this kind of side effect in case this happens this 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 you have to take it because every time getting cancer patient back to the hospital is not possible of course respiratory depression or addiction tolerance are not problem with oral morphine because this group of patients are totally different and even if you want to take oral morphine it's not palatable only if you have a pain you'll be able to take it otherwise you can't take it 
Of course, IV morphine we use for sometimes they come to emergency severe pain. We might use severe pain management. But idea most important is most of these patients we want them to be nursed in at home, not in a hospital. It's very important to understand because they want to stay at their place where they have stayed for so many years, years together, the childhood, everything. They want to stay there. Don't keep them in hospital because see, palliative care is different, critical care is different. You have to understand these two components very clearly. Critical care, where you're going to solve something and all. Palliative care, supportive care, let them stay with their family, let them stay with their own surroundings. What difference are you going to make by keeping in the hospital? Away from everybody keeping in the critical care. It won't work like that. So that's what I would like to make it uh, clear to you. Of course, we have to understand dose titration with IV morphine. Earlier, we used to do it and all, but this days is much less actually. If the pain is more than 5 out of 10 scale, then we might for IV titration and all. But those days have come down. But of course, those days we used to do uh, like getting venous access, uh, giving anti injection injects beforehand, diluting 50 mm morphine in a 10 ml syringe, and treating alicots. Like an alicots means how much alicots? Maybe 40% uh, people used to respond for 1.5 to 4.5 milligram and all. And another 40% respond to 69 milligram. And we should do all this titration to arrive at a particular dosage, what might be required for him so that he doesn't have to come on down. But these days, with the sustained release being available, we are uh, we are not using this particular intravenous. Maybe some setups might be still using it because it's a traditional thing, because it's labor intense. And secondly, most of these people are immunocompromised, they might end up with a new infection if they're in the hospital. Of course, what was studies that said that there was complete relief in 80% of the group of people, none in only 1%, dropouts for 2%. Sedation is part of the game, 32%. Of course, we expect them to cope up with that particular one. So what are side effects of morphine? One is I told like a gastric stasis because um, it, it, it slows down, it slows down the intestinal motility. Of course, many people, we put them in metoclopramide at 10 to 20 milligrams every fourth hourly. And if the patient complains of, or maybe attendant, not the patient, comp, attendant complain like him, he's too sedated entire day, then reduce the dose of morphine. Cognitive failure, because, again, reduce it, because sometimes they would have, you know, they might be still in the position of signing the checks and all those things, or maybe collecting pension and all those things. And if they're not able to identify people and all, reduce the dose of morphine. If it's hyper excitability, of course, but you can start the benzodiazepines things to calm them down. And of course, you can modify them. Morphine dosage. Some people might have vegetable stimulation. Of course, you might have to use cyclizine or dimethyltryptamate uh, aflamethazine to, uh, to counter that one. So these are things expected, but not a routine. But these days, because with better uh, medication available with kinetic dynamics, we don't see these things uh, that often. Of course, some people might have the system release because morphine is known to cause. If it's cutaneous, you can give oral uh, chlorophenamine. The those days we use CPM, I think, I don't know. Of course, now this, this, these days you have cetrogen and all those things. You can try that one. Of course, bronchial, sometimes IV or IM, but that also has come down because a lot of things have, modif have, been, have modified over the course of time. Sometimes you use a bronchodilator and all those things. Yes, you might be using the fentanyl patches for uh, different uh, reasons also, apart from the, uh, I should say, the cancer pain. Of course, it's not recommended. Of course, it's off label use. It's available at 12.5 uh, microgram per hour release, 45 mics microgram per hour, 50 microgram per hour. Of course, buprenorphine also getting quite an, uh, this, of course, this patch works for about 70 hours. And uh, the buprenorphine patch works for about anywhere between 5 to 7 days. But most of the time, by 50 day, people keep on expressing that they are not getting the enough uh, relief. So this is what I was telling you about the role of steroids. Because if you just look at this, there's a, t a tumor. If you were pressing on the nerve, and subsequently put a steroid, you can just make out where the nerve was getting pushed and all those things, it's a neuropathic pain. With this, like a steroid, the inflammation comes down, swelling comes down, and nerve comes back and all. So basically, steroids are, are liberally used. Maybe you can use short pulses for about 10 days, and you can taper it off. That's also not, nothing wrong about it. But of course, general anti-inflammatory effect of uh, steroid reduces the uh, total tumor mass also. But of course, we are not looking at here uh, uh, treating the cancer, but you're talking about the managing the cancer pain. So we come here, which is not a side effect of morphine. Uh, Naveen, are you there? 
Yes, sir. Very much. And yeah, uh, now, now we should take this question now. We should, we should uh, take it this one. So you are uh, having uh, one minute to go. And uh, A constipation, B nausea, C sedation, D midriasis. And uh, I think this is easily taken up by majority of them. And uh, that speaks good about uh, all of post guys and the consultants also. Yeah, uh, so uh, they are still answering and answering it nicely. Right, sir. One minute over, and uh, uh, all of them are of, uh, answered as D. So I think that, that should be fair. That should be good enough, I think, Polly. Yes, sir. Because all these questions are based on Polly. What a discussion we had earlier. Sometimes you might get a bouncer here and there. Don't worry about that one. That's part of the game. So uh, we will move on, uh, Dr. Navi. Yes. yes. And if you just look at the other medication, adjuvants, I was talking about uh, the initial part and antidepressants and uh, anti epileptic water saying. Like basically, these things enhance the descending uh, inhibitory pathways. You're going to have more lectures on pain management, pain pathways, and all polio. Uh, ISA National has uh, lined up uh, topics. And don't worry about that one. It will come as, uh, as, as it evolves and all. Enhance, the basically, antidepressants basically talk of, uh, uh, like an example, like TCA, that is specifically antidepressants. Amitriptyline was the age old drug. Now you have duloxetin, nortriptyline, a lot of these things. Anti epileptics like anti convulsants, we, we were having earlier uh, carbonazepine, oxcarbonazepine, then phenytoin, then uh, we have uh, the gabapentin, we have pregabalin, uh, sodium malprate. Many of these things are there, of course, it may not be part of the gamut of with respect to the, I would like to say, the anesthesia uh, post directly. But yes, you can just have an idea about, yes, these things are there. That's what it, we are trying to say. Yes. And of course, when you use this medication for the what I would like to say with respect to uh, yeah, neuromodulation kind of thing, what we keep on looking They enhance the descending. Like you have got a one, one stimulus which goes from periphery all the way up to the uh, spinal cord and all those things. That's one That's one thing. It goes spinal cord from there, it goes to cortex. And these things modify the descending pathway which comes from cortex and below. So that's how it is. And they, they can they dampen the hypersensitivity of the, hyper of the damaged peripheral nerves. They inhibit the glutamate exit system in the dorsalon and has the GABA inhibitory system in the dorsalon. But these are the properties of this medication. That's where we use the, this group of medications. Sometimes we use psychotropic medication just to calm them in the night and all. We might do night sedatives and all, anxiolytics, antidepressants, but everything, we have to wait. Like you, you cannot have a single template. As I told you earlier, every treatment to every patient has to be individualized and it has to be very clear about that one. One more ladder, probably you might be seeing, of course, I'm not going to ask any question on this one. So, but doesn't mean that you should not uh, look into this uh, thing. A little bit modified, actually, the newer thoughts, newer generation, like your generation. So, question here is the neuropathic pain. What is a four step approach? What, so, what WHO ladder we saw, three step approach. This is a four step approach. So, one, one group is with nerve compression, one with nerve injury because tumor, of course. If the nerve compression, if you steroid, the edema comes down. Nerve starts expanding and patient feels better. And here in that process, there could be some neuropathic pain. For that, you're going to use a tricyclic antidepressant or anticonversion. Step two is step three. If you just look at tricyclic antidepressant, anticonversion, of course, then here comes a NMDA receptor channel blocker. And probably you might be using it regularly in your hospital disease. Ketamine is one thing. Of course, dextromethorphan and one more, some new, some more newer medications are also there coming. So that should not be a problem for you. So this is a first step approach. One is nerve compression and the other one, nerve injury. If injury happens, this group of medication is helpful. If the compression, this group of medications are helpful. So this is what exactly you get an idea. Yes, if they're good, they're as bad. Sometimes unknowingly, I might be doing a, a bad practice in cancer pain management, not bad as to harm the patient. They thought because I did not understand the patient problem. So first and foremost thing is failure to distinguish between cancer pain and others. If I ask you that it is knee pain, I rather require paracetamol or some diclofenac for some few days rather than going for morphine for my osteoarthritis knee. 
I have cancer. I had a cancer earlier, but any pain in the in the body doesn't have to become cancer. Our second thing is failure to evaluate each pain individually and to plan accordingly. Yes, what works for one person may not work for other person. Sometimes you are probably a personal a chat with the person. It makes you feel better. So okay, I am willing to accept. I, you have told me the facts. Fine, I'll I'll try to modify myself. Do all those things. Extra things, okay. I'll even touch with the doctor. That's what they say. The third one is failure to use non-drug treatment, particularly for muscle spasm pain. Somebody says, "I have got spasm here. Why can't you physiotherapy with this, those group of patients? Why should you always any spasm here? Why should you look for medication? Why don't you take a physiotherapy? I mean, personal touch. I mean, some local oil. Something they feel happy about that one." And most important is failure to use an NSAID and opioid in combination. Never try to use only opioids. Always make it a point to use the uh, NSAID with an opioid combination. Of course, and of course, don't forget the adjunct analysis, which they are very important because they make a lot of difference. You may not realize because many people are on neuropathic pain medication. Those days, all these patients used to be hospitalized. Now everything is available maybe over the. Uh, counter many people they take the medication. They of course chemotherapy happens at home also. Medication, there's some tablets and all. So don't forget that particular aspect. So that what you can do about uh, this group of things. To continue saying the what are the bad practices we might do is changing to an alternative analysis before optimizing dose and timing of previous analgesic. This is very important. Any neuropathic pain medication takes at least two weeks. I repeat, at least takes two weeks to build up the blood level. It's not like you take a diclofenac, you feel better, or you take paracetamol, you feel better. No, neuropathic pain medication it takes at least two weeks to build the blood level. So don't be in a hurry. Like you know, there are hardly proven medication which is six about six to eight medications are there. If we start using everything at one go, within maybe maybe ten days everything will be over. So don't be in a hurry to de-escalate very fast. So maintain a rhythm. And combining analgesics inappropriate example. Two week opiate, putting a person both on tramadol and tapetidol, it won't work. A strong opiate and a weak opiate, morphine with tramadol, that also won't work. Have a, have a classic strategy is being described in all those things, which are what we say non opiate, adjuvants, and then opiates. Opiate could be strong, weak, or moderate capacity, that's okay. And failure to appreciate that a mixed agonist, antagonist, such as pentadocin, should not be used in conjunction with codeine and other things. So this, of course, these days, uh, pentos are not available that easily and all. But some places might be available. But make sure that you are clear about the agonist and antagonist combination. And then we see most of the time the physicians, especially not from anesthesiology, because you keep on using the opiates right and left. We know it. Reluctance to use uh, morphine because the fear is there, like it will cause respiratory depression. Because I don't know. And all, like see, all snakes are not poisonous, right? So every snake bite doesn't have to be like a poisonous snake. So because they are not exposed, they think that morphine causes respiratory depression. So that is the concept. So that has to go off on that. That we keep on doing so many public awareness programs. Still, we have that difficulty. And reducing the interval between administrations instead of increasing the doses. Let's say, for example, now for example, if you just look at, for example, every fourth day morphine has to be given. Patient says, not much relief. Then we can give morphine every two hour limit. No, it's not like that. At four hour limit, if you're not happy, 10 milligram, give 20 milligram at that time. Every four hour limit, 20, 20, 20. You had to go like that. It's not that every 10, every two hour you give 10 milligram. No, it won't work like that. And failure to monitor and control adverse effects, especially constipation. Patient may not tell you so many words and all. See, actually, if you just read the Harrison textbook of medicine, even if your ball moves once in three days, that's normal. Or three times a day, also, it's normal. But question here is sometimes culturally you are habituated, like every day morning I need to go to a washroom and I do the, the computer formality. If I don't do that one, that something is missing. So this is one thing probably we have to explain to them, tell them, or maybe if, if you can modify that one, you have to understand. A lack of attention to psychological issues, that's it. You think that medication works, but it's not like that. What problem here last time, it might be different here, but you might have to spend some time in chatting with the person. But never ever run away from listening to the patient. If you don't hear to the patient, you are missing the whole target. Yes, there are certain things uh, we should understand, especially these days because people are living for a longer time. The lifespan has gone up to almost 67 to 70 years. There's some visceral pain in cancer, like probably 
play hollow viscous or solid viscous. The organs enclosed within the body cavities. Because biggest problem is what are uh, talking about all the medications? They all help in nociceptive pain. I repeat, nociceptive pain. It comes visceral pain. It's a bit difficult because many of the medications, including morphine, they give relief up to sixty percent, not more than that. So that's a challenge in the visceral pain, especially if somebody has a serious stomach, serious pancreas, or secondary sin liver. A bit difficult. So in talking of visceral pain, it results in activation of pain receptors by invasion, infiltration, extension, compression, stretch of viscera. Of course, solid viscera, you know about it: lungs, liver, kidney. Of course, they are quite insensitive to the destruction till the time their capsule is not touched. That's very important you to understand is lungs, kidney, and liver, and all those things. If the person has the capsule not touched, they are insensitive. That's the reason you not you never feel somebody has a primary tumor somewhere and liver secondaries are there. And he, when he's burning, you get a, uh, when he comes to you, he asks CT scan. It spread everywhere. How is it possible? Because there is no pain at all for him, for you to re- for him to report to you. This is what you understand is unless the capsule gets touched, he will not. Now for hollow visceral like colon is sensitive, like sensitive stretch and distension. Hollow visceral. If you have colon, a, a lumen which is there, a tumor growing above the colon, you will not feel the pain. If there is something growing inside, it increases, stretch, it stretches that one, then he will feel the pain. So this is what I want you to understand is solid tumors, unless the capsule stretches, they won't feel the pain. Hollow viscera, if the tumor is growing above the viscera, above the, the colon, they won't feel the pain. If it's growing inside, increase the pressure, then they will feel the pain. This is what very crucial. Oh, again we got stuck here. Naveen, you have to help me. So you have to answer uh, which one is not a medication for neuropathic pain, which is not a medication for neuropathic pain. A to pentatol, C trimadol, C duloxetine, D pregabalin. Which one is not a medication for neuropathic pain? Another 10 seconds. Okay. So, sir, we have got a uh, mixed bag, though uh, majority have said A, Tepentadol, but uh, some have answered uh, B and C also. So, uh, you will have to again uh, elaborate, though you have already explained. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Naveen, for that one, because for the helping me out in this uh, particular. But it, it's nice. Uh, there is variation in the answer. Nothing wrong about it, because uh, many people may not be using these medications. I understand, because if I'm a post student, I may not be using many of these medications. Maybe apart from tramadol, I don't use other three. If the consultants are that they might be using it, or maybe something like that. So, uh, uh, let me start from reverse. Let me ask you. So, pregabalin, is a, one of the good medication for neuropathic pain. There is no, not a doubt about it. Pregabalin is an anticonvulsant. It's actually a subsequent derivative of the uh, gabapentin. Duloxin also we use as, as part of uh, uh, tricyclic antidepressant. Like it's subsequent generation of the uh, tricycline, like like amitriptyline. Tramadol goes through both by two pathways. Sir. Tramadol works both for nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. It works goes through serotonin inhibitor also, and it also goes through norepinephrine inhibitor also. Only tapentadol is the one which doesn't go through the uh, norepinephrine inhibitor. That's why it is not a neuropathic pain medication. But other three are used neuropathic pain. Of course, it's a little bit tricky. I don't expect my postgraduate students to uh, use, should be using tapentadol. But question here is, when something doesn't work, we should be knowing why exactly it doesn't work. Though you have very rightly expressed in between uh, that uh, tapentadol is uh, not having a uh, role much in neuropathic pain. Please, sir. 
Yeah. Thank you, Nadi. Uh, so this is just an example. This is a case history. Just like to just make it interesting. Like you know, I have to keep on talking about uh, kinetics dynamics. You may not uh, be comfortable. So a uh, sixty-year-old male. Just just think like that for the time being. A diagnosed with pancreatic malignancy in advanced stage. In advanced stage, received chemotherapy, suffering unrelieved abdominal pain. It goes back to it is back to and all was an opioid and said it's like what you wanted a standard what I was discussing earlier, weak opioids and of course then the uh, what do you call like you know non opioids and adjuvants pain moderator without much relief and subsequently when he comes to us when we saw the CT and all you can just see that this is the pancreas this is the head of the pancreas it's head of the pancreas and uh, this uh, this advanced uh, this thing what I was saying visceral pain. It was a bit difficult for him and all, but see, already if you just, I'll just go back to the previous slide. Opiates you have tried, NSAIDs you have tried, pain moderators you have tried, and I told you all these things can relieve you relief up to about 60 percent, not more than that. In this particular patient with the C head pancreas with that kind of tumor, he was offered select plus neurolysis. A CT guide approach was considered. Because reason being, see, you can go blindly like that. If you go blindly from here. And all you might go into something good. A CT guided or fluoroscopy guided, as per the availability in the particular uh, setup. So at least what happens? This is what if you go from here, it's called retrocrural approach. So you can go from here, needle goes here. This is the area of what you're seeing, and you know that splanking has go like this, and all those things, and you can block that particular uh, what what you select to act because all the lymph nodes will be here, select plexus will be here, and you can do it that way. So that's one advantage of doing the. So a CT guide approach was considered. It was planned in classical retrocrural approach. Needles inserted bilaterally. Channel of seventy percent alcohol was injected on either side. A patient had very good pain relief, and uh, he's comfortable. So this is how the CT guide still place a block is done. Of course, we take a topograph like this, something like this. Oh, once the needles are here, but this is actually classical one is. This is vertebral body. Patient sleeping in the patient lying in a prone position. This is aorta. This is the pancreas, and you can see the kidneys, and of course you can see the other uh, organ, and of course so then you can see the needle coming here. Okay, you can if you go blindly, you might enter into the foramen here. So that's the imaging we use. The needle comes straight here, straight here. You can just see here in CT guide how it appears. It comes straight here, straight here. We always inject contrast to make sure. See, this forms a, a good gutter. It's like a gutter. Kind of thing. So when you put inject uh, 10 ml alcohol, 70 percent either side, it stays in the gutter. And don't forget, all your splanchnus comes from behind, from behind, to, from the spinal cord, and go to the celiac plexus over here. They form the celiac plexus. So if you can block them there, it's called as retrocrural splanchnic neurolysis. Retrocrural splanchnic neurolysis or retrocrural celiac plexus block. So you can see the contrast over here. So this uh, it works with respect to this. Of course, mechanism of visceral pain, if you just look at it, there are high threshold, low threshold receptors are there. Of course, there can be local ischemia because of the, the tumor, there can be hypoxia, inflammation, they activate these things. Uh, other silent receptors, they get irritated. They can trigger factors, they not linked to tissue injury, but nature provoking stimulus. The colon, I told you, like, you know, if something grows above the colon, you will not feel the pain, but if something growing inside the colon, it, it, it distends, it causes. So anything, Distinguishing the uh, colon with internal pressure of uh, more than 450 million mercury, he feels a pain. Of course, solid organs are the least sensitive. Uh, it's, it's more like that. Of course, coming to the mechanical visceral pain, pain pathways, there are visceral sensory information through a sympathetic and parasympathetic chain, which can be there. Dorsal horn, lamina 1, lamina 5, visceral somatic, visceral visceral. It's all convergence, basically. Like you have a pain over here and it goes to the against spinal cord from the test to the brain. Of course, there can be effort pain also, like in a convergence and projection theory can be there. Like you, know, you, you always read about this, like you know, somebody get the, like you know, having the heart attack, getting some pain over the left shoulder or here, something like that, and all. So, effort pain is part of the game. So, this group of patients with visceral pain, they may present aches, cramps, diffuse pain, poorly localized. They don't know, pura pet darad hota hai. I have pain all over the time. They get referred nearby non-visual structures also, like you no. Know, Autonomic reflexes can be like nausea also. Sometimes combined with somatic neuropathic pain, something they don't take adequately. You don't know 
is it because of indigestion or is it because they're not taking orally what is the thing but visceral pain can be very nasty especially if you ask somebody who had a renal colic he will be able to tell you what exactly the, the feeling of the visceral pain or you might have some tummy pain some days you just don't feel like eating anything because it can be the devastating of course to treat this one there's a, a multidisciplinary approach which is there treat the cause most important is if the tumor is there if you want to you can take it out nothing like it if you can't difficult then increase the pain threshold with pharmacological options what we uh, discussed earlier opiates and sedatives and of course pain modulators like the tcs anti convulsant a non pharmacological approach like you can try out uh, physical therapy heat and cold therapy or uh, uh, cbt and all those things of course uh, interrupting the nosity pathway to allow superior analgesia and all nerve blocks and all you can try local anesthetics opiates neurotics and of course sometimes what happens If you're not comfortable in uh, starting with the neurotics, you might start with uh, local anesthetic. But sometimes it's difficult because you might do local anesthetic. Patients are tolerant for two days. Again, the pain has come back. So how long will local anesthetic work like that? Of course, for neurosurgery application limited by survival of cancer patient. But there are centers which do percutaneous cardiotomy. Of course, I'm not aware in India, but there may be some centers who are doing it. But longevity is what you have to look at in like you know. If you're going to look six months to one year, what exactly you want to do? What you want to offer? So uh, this is very important when you offer interventions for this group of patients. If you see the plus numbers, you want to talk about it. So the question is, you know, foregut, midgut, hindgut. All of you are read during this uh, usual days. I repeat again, all of you know foregut, midgut, hindgut. Foregut starts almost from the pharynx, goes up to the I think uh, second part of duodenum. The midgut starts in second part of duodenum. goes up to the two third of transverse colon and hind gut goes on that one third of transverse colon last one goes up to the sigmoid and of course rectum right so don't forget your embryology is very important like the embryology is very important before you offer what kind of interest like fore gut mid gut hind gut celiac crusted block it helps the malignancy of liver spleen pancreas kidney suprarenal gland and intestines up to two third of the transverse colon that means it is working for mid gut mid gut tumors please i repeat it it's working mid gut mid gut tumor then super hypogastric plexus neurolysis pelvic pain due to tumor invasion it works predominantly for the hind gut ganglion impar neurolysis of course uh, one of the youngest ganglion discovered and of course in the all uh, it was discovered in 1980 so peripheral pain due to pelvic cancer or could be a prostatic cancer patient say that i am sitting on some some tumor something like that and all Of course, Cochrane review uh, protocol says something is there. The results of select person neurolysis, if you just look at it, 85 percent success rate across all studies. Across all studies, that the results say select person neurolysis 85 percent. So, so, you should be more than happy to offer this one. If not at your place, at some other place also is okay. It alleviates pain immediately 70 to 80 percent and 60 to 70 percent till death. So, just look at 60 to 70 percent till death is most important thing. Of course, best results are when pain still responds to anti-inflammatory drug. Of course, it's in, in effect advanced quality stage of tumor because when using the retroactive approach and all those things, if it, the solution has to go and if the big tumor sitting there, our lymph nodes are there, they may not always spread of the solution or something whatever. Because the tumor is expanded, the whole plexus get distorted. So this could be some of the reasons why it may not work in some patients. Oh, now we we are in got stuck here. so this is the question uh, which is not a part of celiac plexus neurolysis a not a part ganglion of walder b solar plexus c greater sphenic nerve d shoulder pain
Okay, another 10 seconds to go. Uh, so, uh, majority of you have answered D, but some have answered A also. So, I think sir will again re clarify that why shoulder pain is there and ganglion of Walter, which it where it looks like. Sir, please. Yeah, thank you, Navi. Thank you for helping me out, and uh, I'm troubling you today, <laughs> holding you back for a long time. And but but I'm glad Navin has so many people interacting with the thing and their uh, whatever way they want to address and all. But it's fine, nothing, nothing. It's very good. But, but like, again, I'm telling very clearly. Forty percent have answered A also, sir. Forty percent. That's have good. What I'm saying, but people are uh, like you know the participating is most important. Participation is important here. Like they're not scared of committing a mistake. That's most important. So uh, coming back, which is not a part of celiac plus neurolysis, uh, ganglion of Walter is the yeah. Just I think to put my. Walter, like he had the lumbar, like for example, a lumbar symptom coming here and comes and meets at the sacral, like a sacral cross junction and somewhere here. So that is the one, two lumbar plexus chains come and meet at the sacral coccyx junction. That is called a ganglion of Walter. That's the youngest ganglion discovered. That was recently in 1990. It was discovered by Pancard. You can read about that one. So technically, ganglion of Walter is not part of celiac plexus neurolysis. Reason being, the celiac plexus. I told very clearly, foregut, midgut, hindgut, foregut, midgut, hindgut. So it's because of celiac plus midgut. We talk of ganglion walter, it comes in hindgut. So ganglion walter is not part of neurolysis. Solar plexus is, is actually is actually a traditional word. I would like to before 1980s, it was very popular. So people used to give celiac plexus block at that time. And it was not like a routine, this thing at all. The old days to give. And sometimes whenever they're giving and all those things, like, you know, the, the concept was that we used to give probably 70% alcohol at that time and all. And uh, people used to feel solar plexus, it's got celiac, whole plexus called a solar plexus. It's one more name for celiac plexus. It was called a kick in a solar plexus. If you are, if, if any way of you see celiac plexus block, if you're not going to localize it adequately, the person literally moans with pain, holding his tummy, literally rolling there. So it's called, it's called a kick in a solar plexus. So one more name for celiac plexus is solar plexus. Greater spanking nerve, I told just uh, about greater spanking nerve, lesser spanking nerve, least spanking nerve. All three spanking nerves combined together from a celiac plexus. So that's also part of celiac plexus. Shoulder pain is if you do a celiac plexus block, okay, the solution, I told you, it, it touches the crust of diaphragm. The diaphragm irritation always comes as comes shoulder pain, right? It can be right, for, for right it could be left and all. So basically, in a celiac plexus neurolysis, you do inject 70% alcohol. It hurts the shoulder. So technically, the question was, which is not a part of celiac plexus neurolysis. Shoulder pain, yes, if you don't do it properly, it can come. Greater spanking yes, part of celiac plexus. Solar plexus is other than celiac plexus. Ganglion of Walther, it literally goes to hand gut, which is not part of mid gut. So the answer, not a part of this one is A, ganglion of Walther. But I'm glad so many of you participated in the discussion. Again, I'm telling I'm, I'm thanks, I'm grateful to Naveen for sharing this particular side and he's helping me out. Uh, probably another 15 minutes I should be through with the session. I mean, if I'm not told, if I'm taking too much of time, Naveen can stop me. Ganglion of Walder is also known as Ganglion of Impara. Yeah, Ganglion of Impara. It comes as sacred as the sacred coxal junction. I observed it now. So superhypogastric neurolysis, and of course I'll show you the ganglion. Don't worry about that. I'll show you now. So superhypogastric plexus, uh, neurolysis we talked about with respect to the what you call hand, hand gut. So hand gut with respect to the, the other one third of the transverse colon and the rest of things. So the question is, especially it's quite useful for especially where it's pelvic pain due to pelvic malignancy. Especially say you talk of uh, CA endometrium. CA, uh, I don't, I'm not talking cervix directly, it depends cervix. But what stage you wear or not? Especially the see, you have abdomen, you have the pelvis. So pelvis, what are pains are there? This is the response to hypogastric neurolysis. Less complication when compared with intrathecal. Those, those were the days we used to inject pinor or, or maybe sometimes uh, alcohol into the intrathecal space. People used to end up with ball bladder disturbance. Compared to that one, this is much more safer. Of course, now also some people might be doing it in case somebody already has uh, bowel dysfunction, like maybe on maybe already on maybe uh, ileostomy is done or cholestomy is done. 
or somebody police can they might do but this is very useful because you're not damaging any of those things but it's less effective if extensive retroperitoneal encompassing nerve cluster i told again if the tumor spreads so much over super hypogastric plexus i show where exactly you're doing it again the again it will be ineffective if tumor invades somatic elements of course no control study as it but it's good this is how it is for example if you just look at the super hypogastric neurolysis ana like anatomy look at this one this is how it is the lymph nodes and over here and you can see the aorta here you can see the bifurcation of aorta the ilium the sacrum and coccyx if you just look at over here so, so you have to go to junction of l5 s1 you have to go to junction of l5 s1 i repeat l5 s1 l5 s1 so you can go anteriorly also if you do laparoscopy you can go straight away over there you can inject there make sure that touch the total body come back and all or you can go the or like the way i told over celiac cause retrocrural kind of thing similarly you can go something like this from this junction city guided you can go like this is a needle coming here inject the contact again this forms a gutter here this gutter corresponds to this one of course it may be difficult for the post gas student to understand how exactly ct three dimensional and all and this person already had a, a colostomy if you just look at this particular area and this is the contrast spreads in the gutter see just look at the, the width of the gutter and any plaque any 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 plaque any nerve which is crossing there it will get blocked and this is how it is actually bifurcation i like visits here super hypogastric plexus block you put one needle here one needle here inject the solution and hold all the plexus start bathing in the particular one and you get a good relief you don't have to go to the intrathecal phenolic alcohol reason being that can affect the bowel and bladder so that is one thing you should not forget of course ganglion impar neurolysis what uh, navin was saying also called as a ganglion of walder the procedure reported for the first time in 1990 perineal pain due to very useful actually pelvic malignancy especially in india with uh, so much of uh, cs obx especially not for the cvc it's a ca vulva and of course ca rectum or ca prostate very useful local tumor spread can limit the spread of neurolysis but no control study but very useful just look at this ganglion where exactly is ganglion lies so this is what i was telling about like you know this is the sacro coccyx junction so this is the coccyx this is the junction here the lumbar chain comes here from one side and lumbar plexus comes from here they meet here that's the last junction that's where the whole thing stops that's a ganglion impar and how do you reach that particular one this is a, a anterior posterior if you just look at this is a it is lateral view if you just look at it this is your the spine okay of course what you are seeing over is the rectum you will we'll see like a bowel shadow i'll show that one and the needle it can go like this or this is what we do is this this is the junction where it should be there you come directly like this under fluoroscopy not blindly earlier we used to bend the needle like this now no longer that one the stator come here if you can just look at like you can see like this that the this is a contrast which is there of course there this is what is rectal shadow here if you put a needle here in the contrast it will delineate the whole area like a goblet shape okay and very simple you can just do day care basis then admit admit and also of course the alanger you are sure that you don't puncture the 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 gas in the rectum it's fine you, you can use a fluoro and you can you can do it that will be great of course this very rare malignancy of course there is simple as but then they come to you difficult but this is one of those uh, uh, rare cases where we had to do it and all if you just look at same the principle is same question here is you have to have a concept with respect to what you are doing and why you are doing just imagine from where the cranial nerves come from where to where anatomy spinal cord if you saying about that one spinal cord wherever spinal nerves keep on coming where are the probably your, your sympathetic chain where is your parasympathetic chain how they are coming where they are meeting what is the plexus being formed that's all you have to know and all lenses once you are imaging it like for example imaging accident so this is actually the lungs actually for a simple is very rare, rare but we still do it of course but it tests the vertebral body of course uh, the transfer process subsequent slide here but with ct and all those things we are doing it much faster much quicker also if you just look at this particular one see this said already there is a, a tumor with the fluid and all those things to refusion and this said there one one said lung is there or lung is not there this said lung is not not there so what we did the, the which area affected we put the needle straight over here because there no lung patient won't feel anything inject contrast here confirm inject the solution neurosis and your thoracoscopic implantation come out and this is aorta what you are seeing this is normal like black this is a the 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 denser one which is a pure pure refusion 
looks so attractive with the neural assist and all like you know interventions and all those like going like a high speed bike going at one 180 km per hour or maybe 200 km but most important meaningful expectation is think what is the patient expects how long you're going to how long he might have a, a, like a you know, life span and earlier the better not the later because by the time they come we already have metastases everywhere and because sometimes you they will be told you go to this doctor he'll give one injection all your pain will go off that may not that may not happen a technical skill level bit it, it's a way that there was a difficulty but i'm happy now at least now almost every district head quarters or taluk head quarters so some pain specialist who is doing some kind of work which is making a lot of difference to the entire society and here we respect and of course i thank isa uh, for helping us in spreading this particular message of course there can be something short term relief the initial days are there for many years or sometimes because technical shortcomings maybe i did not know adequate way of doing it or sometimes tumor or celiac plexus can be there where it is not always the solution is spread presence of mets over the plexus a somatic pain secondary to significant peritoneal involvement can be there but look at advantages the advantage with this neural assist is visual pain in cancer patient can be best managed by a combination of analgesics and intervention the common because 60% of pain definitely can manage analgesics but 40% it become difficult sometimes the advantage non analgesic benefits is that is limitation of side effects improved quality of life and weight gain because if you don't make them drowsy with the opioids and all they can eat better sleep better they are more active so these are advantage of non analgesic benefits less sedated when you do intervention less sedated alert and satisfied patient repeat block may be needed if at all they serve for longer time it can repeat it again in imaging assistance you are not doing it blindly so these are some of the advanced things at intrathecal drug delivery systems for cancer pain of course it's something like 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 what you do routine spinal and all if you can just look at this is the implant you can put a, a, a catheter inside and just deliver more because something if you take more than orally at that particular dose is if it is 1000 to 2000 mg in cause constipation so if you just put in a catheter in the like how you put epidural catheter imagine you put a catheter in the subarachnoid space once you put a catheter in subarachnoid space imagine this particular pump like a pacemaker you load this with morphine and give it some microgram nanogram because because you know about that one the receptor opiate receptors there in the spinal cord and brain everywhere once it reaches the nucleus directly there the dose it could comes down significantly but we offer this one only life span is more than 3 months i repeat if the patient's life span is at least more than 3 months then only we offer this intrathecal intrathecal opiate pumps otherwise not as a protein so this is what you have to understand oh navin i think our last one or two slides probably cancer pain management needs a pharmacotherapy b chemotherapy c radiotherapy D interventions, E all of the above. another 10 seconds okay sir all are 100% correct that answer is e the cancer pain management require pharmacotherapy chemotherapy radiotherapy and interventions thank you navin that means we are able to convey the message to the across all delegates poly all the participants i think work post cancer consultants uh, just moving on to the last uh, slide of the today's session summary a combination of medications and interventions are the best and of course i again repeat meaningful expectations for patient family also very clear and again repeat adinistrum better than antinistrum you tell them before hand only this much you can get benefit uh, beyond this you can't earlier the better And of course advanced proliferative stage may not be good relief with the intervention very important very proliferative stage, big tumor lymph nodes ascites it may not offer so be very clear about what to expect in which group of patient of course sometimes you may take repeat interventions don't worry about it nothing wrong about it but of course imaging assistance is very like some gps uh, offers safety and accuracy 
I don't want to do anybody with the surface than my people, lost people, patients, because they put the needle straight in spinal cord, injected the 70% alcohol, caused paraplegia, and they stopped doing all these things. So please, without imaging assistance, please don't put needle anywhere. And that you're not doing this in nerve blocks for anesthesia also. These few words, I would like to say uh, thank you once again for uh, ASA and uh, for giving me opportunity to share my thoughts. Over to you, Naveen. Thanks a lot, Naveen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for that uh, elaborate talk on your cancer pain management. And uh, uh, you can stop sharing the screen, sir. And uh, I'll, yeah. I'll ask the person sitting behind you to offer you a cup of coffee or uh, uh, water. Uh, I know it has been a long uh, time. So there are certain questions which have come up and I'll quickly uh, go through it. Uh, sir has covered majority of the questions which has usually come in the uh, question answers in MD. Uh, most common one is see head of pancreas and uh, draw the diagram of celiac plexus and the celiac plexus block which he has covered. Uh, WHO three-step ladder, explain the role of WHO three-step ladder in cancer pain management. Role of anesthesiologist in cancer pain and palliative care, which he has rightly covered throughout his talk. But one question has come about this WHO three-step ladder. That it, it is is it necessary to come from go from one to three, or you can if pain, pain score is more, uh, maybe ten out of ten, so we can go directly to three. Uh, your thoughts on that, sir? No, that's a very good question. I mean, absolutely, I fully agree with you. It, it it's one is only one thing is. Pain is the, the driving factor. If you, severe pain is there, you start from three to one. You don't have to really all the time start from one to three. No, it's not like that. Start from three, first get hold of the thing, and then you can slowly come to two, and then you can come to one also. That's not a problem. Uh, quick word about uh, pain assessment in cancer patients, sir. No, question. If, uh, I told you pain in, in cancer patients compared to chronic brain, chronic brain pain is also an issue, I'm not saying. But here, the psychological aspect of us, whether patient has been told that he has malignancy or not is very important because then when the participation will be much better in the treatment. He starts believing you. Otherwise, what he thinks that this doctor gives some medication but pain is not going. See, the primary tumor which should have been removed by the surgical team or like, you know, chemotherapy like the internal medicine team, none of them are doing. And you are trying to do anything. The tumor is still sitting there. What is the standard treatment? Treat the cause. The cause is not being treated. You are doing palliative one. So always define your role. Look, this is what I am trying to do. This is what it is. Yes, we know the tumor is... Everybody knows cancer, Navid. Everybody knows cancer across the country. It's not that. They know. They have an idea about that. Okay, There's something. Something which cannot be removed. If that cannot be removed, they will not accept. But person is always make sure that the patient understands what is there. Otherwise, he will keep on thinking that this doctor is just beating around the bush. He's not helping me. Right, sir. And uh, one question has come about the uh, what are the different scales uh, used for uh, assessment or quantifying the pain? Different scales for? For uh, assessment of pain. No, I think the standard thing is, I think still, I go with visual analog scale, 0 to 10 is the best thing. There is actually, the, see, that's a unidimensional scale. You got multidimensional also. That one we use, Megal Pain Questionnaire, that's good for uh, doing a, a thesis a research and all those things. But I find it difficult in day to day clinical practice. I use the single dimensional visual analog scale. But of course, there is multi dimensional. So, of course, in pediatric patient, you let to use the, the Gaucho scale, probably somebody who's handling, handling the pediatric malignancy, they might do better. But uh, you want to do some multi uh, Megal Pain question is there. If you want to try it, uh, there are almost about 20 parameters are there. You can try it, but nothing wrong about it. Right. And uh, uh, which steroid, because we were talking about combination of steroids. Uh, so which steroid uh, will you think is best and uh, what is the dose? Dr. Reshma D has asked this question. No, I prefer to use actually uh, within oral intake and of course I always come with that with a PP inhibitor because it has gastritis and all. Normally I use a pulse therapy. I prefer methylprednisolone. It comes in 4 milligrams and uh, that you might of course not necessarily company A or company B, any company you can use. It, it's just my way of doing it. I'm not saying that it's wrong about using betamazone or dexamazone. But uh, without prednisone, I found other, other one thing is uh, we get Vicelon. That's omnocortil, what we used to use. That also is good, of course. That is about 10 or 20 milligrams, something like that you can try it. But usually I prefer methyl prednisone, 4 milligrams twice daily. I use it for five days. Then I make it three days uh, once daily. Then I make it to maybe alternate day or maybe half it and then again take it off. I use a pulse therapy. Different schedules are there. That's fine. Right, so you have very rightly said that methyl prednisolone because it has got very few uh, systemic side effects. 
uh, lesser than the other steroids. Uh, uh, that's a good thing. Another question which I've already answered, but since it has come up, I'm putting up to you. Uh, sir, since uh, NSAIDs, uh, uh, they are combined in cancer pain management, but uh, these drugs have many side effects. So how many days do you advise to use NSAIDs in patients with cancer pain? Though you have answered it earlier that you can use it for a longer period, but still, sir. Uh, no, nothing wrong. Actually, the, the person who said asked uh, nothing wrong about um, the thing that you, you can see question. You have to look at like, so I, I have seen people using the, uh, I would like to say heterocoxy for uh, so many people with osteoarthritis for days together for 10 days, 15 days, one month and all. What are things like look at the lifespan of person. See, question when you're handling this group of patients, you have to look at the option, explain to them, give a break in between and or something like that. But even though I have used for quite long time, people dying in malignancy with NSAID is almost next to nil. Very negligible, very negligible. Because the question is the lifespan is already fixed. What are you going to do? For example, if I'm sitting at some place in Siliguri and I don't know how to select the block and person is having severe pain, what do you do? Ask him to go to Calcutta, he is not able to go. What do I do with, with that group of patients? How do you help him? So the question you write about that one, say like, this is what the whole thing, explain to them. It's like, it's called informed consent. You tell them that this is what it is, these are the side effects possible. If you're willing, this is what it is. And I think it's better to be honest. Nothing wrong. Because a person, if you don't know, cannot go to Calcutta, say, if I leave, I leave. If I don't leave, I don't leave. So these things are there. I think probably that's what I'm trying to say. This is palliative care, not critical care. I repeat again, this is palliative care, not critical care. Critical care is a different thing, palliative care, different approach. Right, sir. And it's very right. We are managing the pain and making whatever the life is remaining pain-free for the patient as well as for the relatives. Dr. Vasanta, madam, has asked two questions and uh, the role of USG in selectlexis. Well, she basically wants to ask whether uh, we can go do selectlexis by anterior approach by USG guidance and uh, USG guided ganglion in power block. Can it be done with USG guidance? No, USG guided, of course, definitely. Selectlexis definitely. That's one of the therapy or nothing wrong. Not, not everything you have to use CT only. People use CTs, people use fluoro, people use endo ultrasound, medical gastroenterology. You can do the ultrasound. Nothing wrong about it. Absolutely. One more thing you said, Navi. Second question was. Yes, it's not a problem. But question here, it's, the question here, ganglion impar, you only want to do because the bone window is one thing what you understand. My biggest worry is the rectal bowel shadow. That's what my fear. No, no, not about anything else. Like if you put probably uh, needle a little bit ahead, you might enter putting rectum that becomes enema for the patient. 70% alcohol as enema is, is a different story is what I'm trying to say. So that's the only thing. If, if, I, because I do in a particular way, I might say, but ultrasound, I don't see anything wrong about it because nothing wrong. If somebody is ultrasound regularly, if they're comfortable, they can use it. Yes, sir. So, Madam, the answer is that USG guided selectors is blocked by anterior approach and bowel preparation, as far as rightly said, uh, can be done. And uh, G impar people who are... only for the ultrasound with uh, uh, selectors. What I found because I stood anterior selectors block earlier, the lymph nodes can obstruct. I mean, if, if you just look at if, if this is the whole vertebral body, big lymph node, big tumor is there. I went put the needle. And if you just probably, I don't know, anybody has tried to go through the uh, lymph node, it will be so hard, the needle gets bent. Right. You think you're deposited, but you're not deposited. So that is one problem, especially you go through the anterior, because ultrasound, you're going to anterior, because posteriorly, if you go, you get a bone window. But if you have actually a skill in that, nothing wrong about the imaging technique. But imaging technique, it should be the best thing, not anything less than that. Right. Dr. Anmol has asked, uh, yes, he has uh, rightly about that question in MCQ, which you were asking about the neuropathic pain, that tepentatol is a weak serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitor, and it has also some role in neuropathic pain. So that's a uh, theoretical... Yeah, it's, it's a good thing, but question we, clinically, we are not at seen, of course. It's just uh, nothing wrong with it. Of all the medication, which is more neuropathic, you should take it like that. Yeah. So nothing, uh, nothing wrong. But I, I, we are not able. We are not able to get it in that kind of response compared to what we try But fine. There could be weak. This one may not be up to that point. But maybe of all those medications, which is the most appropriate. Which are the three best. So uh, basically, at times the question may not answer may not be hundred percent wrong. Uh, and tepentadol has been uh, studied for weak. But, uh, but I'm glad people are reading. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to so happy people are reading. That's most important. In neuropathic pain, but out of which, uh, which are the three which are commonly used? And sir, uh, another thing is uh, about the question has been asked about esophageal malignancy. Uh, is celiac plexus block fully effective for visceral pain uh, in patients with CA esophagus? 
difficult. I, again, I told differently right now because of what select pressure you are saying. Uh, Forgot midgut handgut. If you look at a select pressure supply comes from greater splanchnic, lesser splanchnic, least splanchnic. If you just look at it, T11, now uh, T10, T11, T12. Now you, you just look at where is the malignancy of esophagus. What level? Then you will have the answer for your question as simple. If you lower one third of piece of because you want to try something, maybe. But just because nerve supply is from T10, 11, 12. If you upper upper like if you have an over here or a bit here, how how will select plus block? Until nuts are there, it's a different story. I have not found because I have not done for uh, isophil malignancy. So I, only for lower one third is sometimes because spread is there. I might do it. Water relief, you can get out of it. It's fine, but not, not more than that. So yes, uh, uh, Dr. Kritika, uh, we asked this question. Yes, it has got some role, uh, as Sir has very rightly said, for the lower uh, piece of vision malignancy, but you have to combine it with other modalities also. Sir, another question is, uh, yes, uh, which we uh, have to discuss, cancer pain management in uh, head, neck, and face cancers. Well, CA, uh, tonsil, or uh, uh, oral face, uh, oral cancers, or uh, and CA hypofiring. So there was a question from Dr. Nilesh L that uh, maybe uh, about the drugs as well as uh, loss of range nerve blocks and other things. Uh, they want to listen something about that. Yeah, medications wise, uh, Navin, nothing much changed in principle. What we say, WC ladder, one, two, three, that's our three to one, what's your combination? Interventions point of view, say, for example, uh, let's understand if you're talking sympathetic nervous system, for example, if you just look at it, for example, I have got a malignancy over here. The sympathetic nerves are going, climbing here through the sympathetic chain. I can go for stellar ganglia. One, one aspect. Second thing is you got spinopalatine also. If a malignancy here, go here. The most tricky thing is the trigeminal. Because trigeminal supplies the entire the half face of one side. And you have a malignancy here. And I put a needle through this one to go up to the foramen oval. I'll be depositing the, the infected area or the tumor interstate into CSF over there at Michael scale. So trigeminal is a little bit tricky. Definitely you can sell it. You can definitely do spinopalatine. Glasophangel, I don't mind. Biggest problem with glasophangel is if it causes, say, for example, if somebody has a tumor already has impaired the fixed glasophangel nerve, I do a block here, and subsequently the patient starts aspirating, it becomes a problem. Or you can do diagnostic block for two, three days, and then you can try it out. But that becomes a second thing is you want to our radio frequency laser over there. Don't forget the internal carotid artery and internal jugular are just next to the glasophangel nerve. And doing that one, because we are sometimes we keep on saying Abhimanu Nai Banneka. Don't try to Abhimanu that you knew how, how to enter Chakra Vyo, you did not how to come. If you're not sure about that, the best thing is I do a diagnostic block, local anesthetic, and then stay there. If repeat settings are giving good relief for them, fine. But select, no issues, spin up no issues. Trigeminal, my only concern is the infection you can deposit it into the trigeminal, uh, sorry, uh, Michael scale. Uh, another question has come about the commonly used neurologic agents, sir. And I think especially phenol I used to use earlier actually because I was playing defense. I'm talking about uh, three decades back. I used to use uh, phenol. I, I was like my, my initial part of my career and all. But once phenol is a local anesthetic, local anesthetic. What happens? You get good relief today. Next day, more, next day, the same time, it's on 50% relief because local anesthetic effect goes off. So I still prefer 70% uh, alcohol as a better one than the you know phenol. I might use for intercostal, but now that I read a frequency, I have not used phenol for more than now 10 years now. But I still use 70% alcohol for uh, super epigastric and ganglion impair. Ganglion impair, this time I'm doing radio frequency. Epigastric also, because where a plexus is there, radio frequency cannot work. You cannot put needle, 10 needles over there. You have to solution. So, for example, with coming to the, with respect to select pluses or super I am comfortable. Ganglion impair, I prefer, a, I should say, radio frequency. I still select and spin up pattern also. Phenol almost I not use for more than 10 years. I still right. prefer a 70% alcohol, but there are people who are working in the special military, working at higher reach of Himalayas and all, not only our country, neighboring country, they still prefer to use alcohol or phenol for trigeminal neurology because they have to help the local tribe people, they don't have the RF machine. So if somebody using it, that doesn't mean that anything wrong about that. One. Right, sir. Another question is, uh, what are the precautions to be taken for use of transdermal patches in patients in, for cancer pain? Transdermal patches are good question here is that that's not a substitute for morphine because sometimes industry also drives the particular, like you start using our patch and so that you kill the local market with this morphine. I, I have not found any advantage of uh, patches. Patches only look cosmetic, looks like, you know, you might sleep with that one, you don't have to get up to take a pill. It will keep on releasing. That's one. 
And second thing, especially if you, in this group of fentanyl patches you're using, especially useful when people cannot take tablets orally because you can mucositis or some tumor and all, this really helps. Depression, respiratory depression, all those things, it's not a problem. The biggest challenge for us is, is that attendants using this particular patch is the biggest fear for us. One thing is, always make sure that you never prescribe any, any of these patches for more than a month. Because in the meantime, patient dies. The attendants come to my, my father cannot come, please give me a repeat of prescription. And he might be start, he might start taking the patches. And the people I have seen, people I, I read about at home, they scrape the whole fentanyl thing and start injecting into their vein. So don't forget people have creative ideas. And the worst thing is a, a grandfather with malignancy at home in the room and a grandchild going there, a grandpapa is sleeping, the patch is over, he kept it there, and the, the child thinks a sticker, puts it on his skin, and the drug starts releasing. So especially if you don't dispose of the patch, you should make sure that either you, you put it like hold it back on itself and or and definitely you should walk it, wash it with the warm water so that it gets flushed off. Right. Uh, two more questions have come up. Uh, treatment for uh, chemotherapy induced neuropathy, sir. Sir, come again. Sorry. Treatment uh, for chemotherapy induced neuropathic pain. Chemo induced. Uh... Chemo, chemo induced. I, I know this, but first, so that's so. Chemo neuropathy is very difficult. See, sometimes what happens? Chemo neuropathy is looking at it's a it's a it's a, a discomfort which is nothing but systemic reflection. It's not that some people might have mucositis and all those. They may not. They may just overlap the ulcer. It cannot be like that. The ulcers might be the entire the. GIT track. So don't forget about that one whole thing. Neuropathic pain and all those things, of course, these are the standard medication which are there, pregabalin, gabapentin. Of course, you have to look at supplement, how much food is he taking? <clears throat> pregabalin, gabapentin, of course, carbamazepine, uh, oxanazepine, phenytoin, and of course, uh, baclofen is one more thing. This is a standard medication. But no neuropathic pain, before that also, you have to make sure nutritional depletion, how much they have lost the trace elements in their body. That's very important. You had to build up that one. Selenium, drug of folic acid. So many things might be there. But usually they respond to this one. Neuropathic pain, cream therapy induced intervention do not have any role. Right, sir. And the final question is the patient uh, who has been taking opioids comes for uh, anesthesia. So what is, uh, what is the uh, guidance for the use of uh, analgesics in such a patient? Don't change your strategy. Already he has been anesthetized. Take him the way he is, whatever he's taking that day morning, you ask him to take that one. If you want to use interrupt, use probably insects and all this. Once post up is comfortable, I can take him back, let him go back on his medication. The job is done. And uh, so, what, so the, uh, I hope the answer question which uh, was asked is uh, answered. Now, uh, we have exhausted all the questions which were asked, and I'll give an opportunity to mute uh, all of you, uh, unmute yourself. So uh, all are uh, muted, but you can now unmute yourself. If there is any question, you can ask directly to Dr. Munita uh, Yes, Dr. Ganyotri, sir, please. Good evening, sir. Sir, you're muted, sir. Hello, Dr. Joshi. Can you listen to me? Dr. Joshi, sir, unmute yourself. Yes, sir. Sir, good evening, sir. Sir, good evening. Sir, my, my question is that the patient with the anticoagulants, sir, how much you consider before giving the block about the coagulation factors? Sir, any block you want to give, the, whatever you would have done for the regional anesthesia, sir, what, what principles you follow for subarachnoid block, same thing up to here, nothing special. How much the alcohol interrupts? in the coagulation factors sir whatever things brought what we follow also same things for example if the patient is an anticoagulant because i have same. seen no sorry i have seen the cases of hemorrhage after the block that was the problem no that is a question sir the question here is anticoagulants the way you follow epidural what are the you follow for regional anesthesia the epidural or subarachnoid same thing applies sir we have not found with the last two and a half three decades we have not found any abnormality any group of patient Yes, in case if I don't use the imaging technique properly, if I straight away puncture a great vessel and he had atherosclerotic, definitely is going to cause the hematoma. No, 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 no. Anyway, I think it does affect. 
maybe sir but i have not seen maybe i'm not i'm not because, saying that no, i have reason, not seen no reason behind these patients are hypoproteinemia and other coagulation factors are deficient and henceforth this is my personal feeling and my personal experiences i always take the coagulation all these reports in hand before going See, for all friend these so you, you, you have to do all those things you cannot go for a block without doing any other coagulation parameters uh, testing and all those things. you're not supposed to patient argue is that patient has come you just step in like no it's not like that follow the water stand for stand protocol you've done for the pre and check up and work up everything has to be done the standard template we only only in convince you put a needle otherwise don't put a needle no, as a reason like man all these drugs which are patient is taking as a pain killer they all affect the coagulation but the risk we have to explain to the family sir we have to explain to the family then only you can take it up but the same precaution what you take for the anesthetic purpose save the standard save pre check up everything you have to do standard what you could have done sir and we follow but if still i feel that this should given the more priority before giving the blocks definite blocks no definitely you can always diagnostic block nothing wrong about it sir thank Just you obviously. thank you very much sir it was nice to see you for long time sir good to hear from you sir so nice thank you okay. thank you navin dr agnotri sir uh, uh, i also reiterate the same things which uh, sir was saying that patient who is on anticoagulant or on chronic alcohol use or on chronic nsaid use basic investigations uh, for giving administering any regional block are done for uh, cancer pin blocks also uh, we have got another question coming up uh, dr kritika you wanted to ask something uh, yes sir yeah please go ahead uh, sir uh, i encountered one patient with uh, lumbar sacral plexopathy uh, the patient had uh, metastasis the psoas muscles on both sides she is a patient with uh, lower esophageal malignancy with uh, metastasis distal mm-hmm. bony metastasis vertebral metastasis and also in the psoas so uh, in this the patient had uh, pain in the lower back as well as in radiating to the uh, limbs lower limbs so uh, how to judiciously use the steroids or as the patient was responding only to steroids in this case despite giving uh, celiac neurolysis i gave a diagnostic block the patient responded so i gave a block but despite that the patient continued to have back pain and uh, lumbar sacral i mean uh, the radiating pain in the limbs and uh, she got some relief and she was able to extend only after giving pregabalin the limbs lower limbs but despite that the pain was not completely relieved so uh, she was getting relief only with steroids but how long can you uh, uh, administer steroids and if at all if you have to administer how much you have to give and how you have to titrate the dose um so i just wanted some explanation you know physically as a, I, i can make out what you are expressing at all the question is as rightly said all the meds were there or the 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 sovas area i was sitting over lumbar plexus and all has lower limb weakness steroids is asthma patients who just look at people with asthma they take for life long steroids oh okay so first thing you should understand there no limitation about how long the steroid can be given yes how you are going to monitor is most important thing here and all so question here is nothing wrong about it so one people take steroids nothing wrong about it so that's why i'm trying to say critical care is different and palliative care is different here the person has a, a general discomfort and all those things and you said also pregabalin was helping and also steroids were helping and still yes. person block though you did probably you felt but it did not help beyond a limit but the perception that's fair enough so that's how we are learning but what in print says steroids and all those things there's no limit as such and all look at his life span with medicine okay. source meds everywhere how long is he going to live so always in take decision always take the family into confidence and even the treating what the clinician is there tell them that this what the whole situation this is the best that can be done rest somewhere they have to you have to accept the facts ma'am okay sir she was having some myopathy and all she was having some uh, it is start ma'am because myopathy not this the meds are sitting on the source muscle what else you can expect is what i am trying to say meds were there but yeah. even in the um, upper limb she was having some amount of uh, weakness okay, upper limb muscle because how much you can real because nutritional they'll be down and uh, like you know for uh, senior faculty dr agnyot sir was saying nutritional they'll be down how long they had a good food what a protein mass whatever the poly talk of with respect to uh, what i would like to say uh, trace elements and all this and lot of these things are there it's not just a question of i do an intervention and he'll start walking next moment it doesn't work like that okay sir thank you thank you thank you so much are there any uh, 
more questions, please, because I can see uh, uh, Dr. Balbir Chavada has also logged in, my teacher, and uh, I am also seeing uh, that there are some of our teachers who are COVID positive right now, they are also logged in. So I uh, salute the spirit of teaching across the country. So any, uh, Nishan, uh, you have been moderating and helping me out with comments from your side also. Today, it's my pleasure to interact. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. And, uh, it is just an honor to be sharing the screen with the stalwarts like Murlidhar, sir. Uh, and it has been a wonderful uh, talk, sir. I mean, uh, very, very nice, I'm sure, for the postgraduates. So, uh, I think uh, it's almost uh, one hour and 45 minutes. And uh, before I formally thank Dr. Murlidhar Joshi, uh, this talk is available on ISA NHQ, ISA YouTube channel. And also on ISA website, isaweb.in, in the ISA Academics tab. Uh, Dr. Mulida Joshi, it was a pleasure interacting with you over the last uh, quarter to two hours. And uh, I am very sure that the postgraduates, practitioners, uh, all would have been benefited by your talk on cancer care management. And uh, we look forward to more deliberations from your side in coming months. It's my pleasure. Thank you, uh, Navin, for inviting me. Thank you, Nishan. Thank you, Navin. Thank you, Nargiri. Namaste. Namaste. Thank Namaste. you, sir. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you. And uh, next week, Monday, we will be continuing with uh, cancer pain uh, on chronic pain management only. This time, it will be uh, on non-cancer pain. Uh, topic is chronic pain management, what I should know as anesthesiology PG. And that talk I shall be uh, delivering to you. Thank you very much.